This is May 28th to 2010, 2010, sitting in the wonderful home of Bob Simpson on Pelletier Creek. Mm -hmm. And Bob is a outdoorsman, newspaper columnist, author, and uh, we're happy to be in his home today. And uh, Bob, tell me about how, uh, a little bit about, you know, where you were born and your parents and how you came to be in Carter County. Well, let's see, I was uh, born in a little town, Havana, North Dakota. My uh, mother was a uh, licensed pharmacist and she ran a newspaper office. And uh, my dad was a uh, newspaperman from they had, had homesteaded in the Dakotas and Montana. And my grandparents came out there, a Holmes family, uh, from originally originating from uh, Massachusetts or somewhere up there. They came out there in the middle 1800s and uh, homesteaded. And they ran a, a uh, general store and, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's that's great. So newspaper and writing was in your blood already. I mean, you, yeah. did, you didn't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came then. World War Two came by, and I enlisted, and uh, I went to the West Coast and did a bunch of stuff. And then they they shipped me to uh, Oak Cherry Point, it was just freshly opened, and uh, I was a, I was assigned to. Uh, 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 open Atlantic Field, mm -hmm. and we flew dive bombers out of there, like S the SB-2C dive bombers. Oh, you got a model hanging from the ceiling. Yeah. Did you put I, that model together? Yeah, and um, see, originally I started out, I was supposed to be a bombardier, mm -hmm. and uh, they and at PVJ, or the B same as the B-25, they took the uh, bomb site out and they put a 75 millimeter cannon in the front end, and they did as they didn't need a bombardier; they needed a gunner. So that, that's the reason I was sent here. I believe I'm not. I, you don't know the mysterious workings of the military. <laughs> but anyway, I ended up in this dive bombing outfit for a while, and then I went to navigation school. And uh, went some coffee. Yeah, how about a cup of coffee? Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. And, and you nothing in it for me. And. Uh, we, we flew out of the Atlantic Field, the open, open Bogue Field, and of course headquarters was uh, Cherry Point, and there was Oak Field over there. Well, I'm not familiar with Oak Field. Where's that? It's up on the Trent River. That's okay. where the... Uh, um, the Harriers? They, the, the Har not the Harrier, the, uh, the new, the vertical takeoff... Uh, Osprey. Osprey. Yeah. They are flying. Oh, okay. But, uh, they, it's a, just an out, outfield for the June. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I saw the uh, results of the torpedoing, and there was something that I always thought nobody seems to remember. Right behind Fort Macon, there was a, an area they call there where they hauled all of the debris, the deck houses, the, de the hatches, the cargo, the whatever floated, they drug ashore and put it in there. And uh, right behind that was a place called Tombstone Point. Now, I thought it was because that's where they all, the wreckage was hauled, but someone else said that was a Civil War burial ground. Now, I don't know. I can't tell you. Oh. But the old maps, on some of the old maps, it was Tombstone Point. Okay. Uh, let's see. There was the uh, artillery, uh, the 155s on the, at the Cape, and there was a couple at... Uh, Fort Macon and some down the beach a little bit, and then there was a uh, they put in they were putting in a torpedo net or a sub net from the outer tip of uh, at the Cape down to the middle of Shackleford. Uh, let's see, and uh, it was a busy place. Sure. Now that was World War Two. Um, then uh, at the end of the war. Oh, I, uh, from then I was a navigator and I flew around in VMR 252 in cargo planes to haul and supplies. At the end of the war, I went... Did they do, train you, excuse me, did they train you for photography or anything? I mean, oh, did, no. Did, no. But no. did they make use of your skills already as a photographer in, no. in the Army? I mean, no. in the Marine Corps. Corps. No. No. Um, 
Well, the war was over. I went back to South Dakota to go to school. Mm -hmm. I was going to school, and uh, my uh, I have a phobia of aircraft. My mother, well, I flew all through the war, no problem. And uh, my mother asked me if it was safe to fly, and I said, of course it is, you know. So she hooked a flight from uh, Minneapolis to Chicago to see my brother, and coming back, the wings come off the plane. So I had been, and I got, uh, now, I'll go back a little bit further. While I was here, I met on the train between Minneapolis and Washington, D.C., I met Mary, and uh, we got acquainted, and I went back and forth. To, oh, thank you. Thank you, honey. To uh, uh, see, see her, but we didn't get, didn't really, in war time, you wouldn't, didn't get much time. But she said she lived in Woodburn, Iowa. Okay, after the war is over, one Christmas, I said, well, I was going to school in South Dakota, Tony. So I had a car with no windows that had been rolled over a few times. <laughs> and Colt was from Dakotas. Well, I drove up to Iowa, but I couldn't find Woodward on the map, but I found Woodbine. So I figured that must be it. Never heard of it. So I went back home, a little bit disappointed. Well, she probably married and so on and so on. That summer, I went out to officer's training in Denver, Colorado. I was walking down the street in front of the Blue Parrot Cafe, and I heard his voice say, Hey, Bob. It was, it was Mary. And she was secretary to my commanding officer. Oh, my God. I said she trapped me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, then we uh, we had been married. i have been married a year. My mother was killed. In my, that plane. And my younger brother, Bill, uh, well... Yeah, so I'm going to have to take care of them. Mm -hmm. By the way, in those days, the settlement, they didn't have fancy settlement. The settlement for the airlines was the cost of the funeral. <gasps> oh, and nothing, for, nothing for Bill or anything else. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we packed up the Model A and, and I made a, built a trailer and headed this back here. I, I uh, wrote, I remember Day Cock Brown. And I thought ACOC was still news, running the newspaper here. So I, I just, but I couldn't remember his name, and I wrote the newspaper, and I said, I said, do you got any work? And they said, well, we'll give you a six-week trial. You pay your own expenses, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> so I came out here in Lockwood Sr., and we, he, we got along fine. But uh, as I say, uh, Lockwood... Uh, and I agreed that we didn't dis didn't agree. There you go. Yeah. And uh, I guess I was became a freelancer again, and I was strictly on the bum trying to find some some way to. I was eating seafood and and swapping it for PMs. Which it's in that book when the water smokes. Right. Anyway, um, let's see. Oh, World War Two. I mean, the Korean War came along. And I got a nice little letter. I just the first time I'd had a job, the whole time. This was in August. I got a job, and it had started the first of September. And I worked a month, and I got a letter saying you will report to San Diego for active duty. Oh. So I quit my job, but I wrote the, the Marine Corps and said, "Look, I'm out here at Cherry Point. Why don't you have me report here? I don't have the money, frankly, just to drive to." Right. You know, either give me a, a, I'll fly me out there if you want, but whatever you want to do. First orders canceled. New orders will follow immediately. January, December, January, February. And I'm without a job, hungry and oh, hard, Lord. and yes, hard sir. up. And finally, I reported to him. Same, same squadron doing the same thing in World War II, back car hauling cargo, mm. and. Um, End of that war, uh, I started to uh, beg, well, I need to get further education. So something about going north to go into school in Washington, D.C., and we, oh, we were living on a boat. I couldn't afford a house. I paid $2,500 for the silver spray, the black and white in the middle. Mm -hmm. 
beautiful. It was a nice boat. A um, fellow, uh, Howard Whitney, came through one time on, from New Jersey, and he said, well, why don't you come down? I'm going to school in Miami. And I said, well, I can't afford that. He said, it's cheap. To live is easy. Well, what have I got to lose? So I headed down to Florida, and uh, I got a job uh, doing little you know, odds and ends and so forth. And one day I was out with my boat. Well, t I'm taking uh, marine si journalism and marine sciences. And I was out with a boat and I found a, uh, about a 60-foot boat on the, sh on the reef. And I went over to see what was happening. And the uh, fellow's engine gone out, his pumps had gone out, and, and he'd run it on the shoal to keep it from sinking. Well, I pumped it out, towed it back, but I didn't have the fuel to take it all the way to Miami. He said, well, it's all right, I own an, an island down there. I said, and I got a generator, and, we, and a, we'll just bring it in there and put the, put the generator on it. And, okay. Well, he had a nice little 30-acre island, Boca Chita, which is the uh, headquarters for Biscayne National and a Seashore, whatever, mm -hmm. National, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's, it's, that's the present headquarters for it. But at that time, it was uh, Gus Carlson had it in the Morell Meatpacking Company. Wow. And uh, I got a job as a caretaker for a, short, for a while. So, and then I was running a boat for the university, uh, marine research. Uh, well, actually, more of my job was to take people out and entertain them so they'd make donations to the right, school. Right, right. You had to court them. Yeah. <laughs> you had to court them. So basically that was it. Well, then somewhere down there, uh, let's see, uh, Jim, uh, I think of his name. Uh, let's see, right for, he wrote for uh, outdoor uh, magazines. What's his name? Dean? Hmm? Dean? No. Anyway, uh, he uh, he suggested I start writing my some of my stories for uh, boating magazines. Well, that sounded like a good idea, and they sold. And so that went more and kept more and more. And then meanwhile, somebody asked me to represent the Inland Waterway, be the rep their representative, and go back and forth, up and down. And uh, so I'd come up here in the summer. And uh, that's where I, well, uh, I met a lot of interesting people. For example, Burl Ives offered to, uh, was a job working on Wind Over the Everglades, the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was tired of the mosquitoes, and I didn't think I wanted <laughs> He He became a friend of ours. And uh, then we came up, we were up here one time, and I wanted to learn photography. Well, the best, by far, the best photographer that I know, I've been, I'm still, I haven't seen anyone better, was Jerry Schumacher. He was just, and I told him, said, look, I need to learn. And uh, he said, we'll split anything over. In other words, you, you go ahead, and you do some of the waterfront stuff, and he'll, he's, he's going to stick with a commercial. Mm -hmm. And he said, but uh, we'll split 50-50 after expenses. Mm -hmm. I said, that sure sounds fair to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he taught me photography, and uh, he's, uh, he was good. And you were, and, and so uh, on the waterfront, you took a lot of those pictures of the people coming with their catches and the boats, I took boats. most, to, I would say I did two-thirds of them. I did not not too many for Otis because uh, Reginald Lewis was, was there, and uh, but most of the rest of the waterfront, and this is where, like, uh, having been working up and down between here, Florida, and all the other places, and seeing the various ports, I saw this fishing fleet was far ahead. Maybe not in the fancy boats, mm -hmm. but in the fishing. Right. They were way the ahead. Pitches. And uh, so I started promoting the uh, the fishing, and then started set up that. Fabulous fishman program, mm -hmm. and uh, let's see. Well, that's where we uh, that's where we uh, raised the money. Mary, uh, we went had a meeting, a little 
three or four of us uh, at the sanitary. And uh, I said, I know there's a Marlin out here. We need to raise a purse. And I said, how about each one of you tossing in, say, $25 as a bet? If you, if you, uh, if we catch the Marlin, it goes to award. If you don't catch a Marlin, you get your money back. Mm -hmm. well, they, they thought it was a sure thing, didn't they? <laughs> they thought it was a sure thing. Well, uh, Mary went out, and she, I think she raised about $350. Uh, did you talk with Tony about that? No, but I have to go back. <laughs> well, like you just asked <laughs> because he he, is, he had a little red went down the roses and got a little red cart uh, wagon and loaded. We well, got three hundred fifty from silver and from uh, had it shipped in anyway in mm -hmm. silver silver dollars mm -hmm. and uh, we made a ceremony of bringing in and then Tony would toted the wagon in there. People appreciate that, you know, a little mm -hmm. ritual, a little ceremony, and and uh, I think that's one thing that people forget nowadays when they, they have some of these. Well, events. that's about the same time. Uh, see, that's 51, 52 years ago. Anyway, uh, meanwhile, I got, got a hold of that old cannon. Oh, yeah, the Lyle gun. The yeah. Lyle gun. Mm -hmm. And I said... The only way to do this right is when the boat comes in with Marlin, we'll pop off that gun, and that'll wake up the town, and they'll come down there, and they'll appreciate. Mm -hmm. And so we expended quite a bit of ammunition for a while. It, uh, is that the one that you loaned the museum for, for a long time? Or, or oh, no, it, uh, there's still one at the museum. Yeah. Um, I, what's his name? The machinist out here. Percher. I think he borrowed it from the from the from the museum, mm -hmm. and he's been making duplicates and selling them to various reenactors. He gets, about, he, he, and he gets like about ten thousand. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's a lot of brass. But anyway, uh, I think he has it, and uh, I told the museum that uh, if they they want to use it, use it. Well, uh, you know uh, the the one that you left the Maritime Museum. Uh, uh, I learned to fire that mm -hmm. gun, and I was scared to death of that gun because when you it kicks back, and there was no shot in it. Yeah, it still ten, you know, twelve feet ca came back, and well, with no shot, and it, it came back about five feet in sand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, oh yeah, and that's a powerful little gun. Let me let me put it this way: I quit. I fired it for Beaufort several times, mm -hmm. and then they they got careless, mm -hmm. and. You can't do that. They, they, they were trying some shortcuts and things like that. And I said, I didn't want anything more to do with it. Right. Because. Right. That's, that's all it takes is a, is a mistake like that. Uh, but tell me about your first time you went to the Cape or Shackleford. Do you, you remember any impressions of that? Well, I'm not sure the first time, but I, I think it was one of the times that I was hungry. And um, I went over there with and I anchored the boat. Which boat was this now? Silver Spray. Silver Spray. And uh, we, I went ashore and um, armed with my thirty-eight. And we, I was, I was pigging on getting the hog for. Because the hogs were running wild on the yeah. on the island. And I figured the cattle had probably belonged to somebody, but the, I figured the hogs didn't. So anyway, I was sneaking through the bushes trying to find a hog. <laughs> And uh, I came out, this old billy goat, and so I popped it. <laughs> but at that time, I think it was Arthur Rose. Remember the old float planes that the fisheries oh, yeah, had? Yeah, uh -huh. Well, about this time, he came winging over there, and I'm hiding in the bushes. I don't think he saw me, but <laughs> <laughs> did you ever eat? No, I know you never have. I have eaten goat. Yeah, but not, wrestled, not one that's skinned not, in the sand dune. Right. Right, that that is true. But I, I had some in Washington D.C. You leaving, honey? Okay. Good to meet you. Wait, nice Connie. Meet you. Tell tell her real quick. Uh, uh, straighten me out, wasn't it? The uh, first of all, four acres for a dollar. Mm -hmm. um, Who was that? My ancestors. Yes. Sold the property to the government. There, I think there were. Two or three families. Cape Lookout? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. And uh, um, 
My mother was real proud of that because... And what was your maiden name, Connie? My maiden name was Robinson. Mm -hmm. Her name, her mother's maiden name was Poole. And it was Etheridge's, wasn't it, or not? Um, it was the Piggots, I think, that were our ancestors. Mm -hmm. I, I've got all the paperwork that somebody looked up. But um, Stephen Decatur Poole, yes. have you heard of him? Yes. Well, that's my mother's great-grand... No, her grandfather, my great-grandfather, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Well, we'll probably have to come back and do an oral history with you. There you okay. go. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm she, learning. Yeah. I just moved here. Okay. Uh, in 2005, but... Uh, she moved back. Yeah, my mother grew up in Beaufort and moved away and then moved back, and so... Well, wonderful. And, she remembers Carrot Island. Yeah, they used to call it Cart Island. Mm -hmm. You, did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. the Yankees thought they were saying carrot. carrot. <laughs> You'll be back for lunch. Yes, I'll be back for lunch. Okay. Okay, honey. Good to see you. So, so you you shot a goat on Shackerford Banks and mm. pickled, so, pickled it in an old fifteen gallon jar and lived on it with. I think my teeth are half an inch shorter. <laughs> was the a sand. little tough, and the, and the and and you skinned it in the sand and it got in the meat and. And uh, then, then I began to hear. Well, this that was very early. Much later, I began to find out rumors about the. the uh, uh, they were talking about extending the highway from Norfolk to Myrtle Beach, and they wanted Highway Twelve, and they wanted to run it down the banks. Mm -hmm. um, well, somewhere in there, that era, uh, the. Uh, Wildlife Federation had asked me, "No, this is not the state. This is the, it, the North Carolina, but not not a not a government group." Mm -hmm. uh, had asked me to be a field representative, and uh, they they liked some of my writing and stories and so forth. And during that period, um, I began to be concerned about the the beach there because. To me, it was too valuable to, to be turned into a tourist trap, mm -hmm. which it is, excuse me. <laughs> I had, I We could put, okay. So, um, uh, so it, they were going to put Highway 12 down Corebanks too? This, this was the, uh, this was this a discussion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I got, uh, very much upset about that. I remember going to the state. Uh, before the appearing before the state legislature and talking about it, and let's see, that was the same time that uh, Alfred Cooper. I met him up there in the state legislature, and he was getting all the, the North Carolina church groups together to oppose the drug track because that was Ill, sinful gambling. Because it took away, he was afraid they'd take business away from his gambling emporium on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any, anyway, um, I, I started working with legislators, trying to encourage them best I could to set it aside. And my goal was have it as a wilderness. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a good back and forth. And of course, you can talk, but you don't know what's going on. And that they have their own agenda. Anyway, uh, that's when I came up with that the idea. We got that old. You remember that old amphibious truck I had? I I, I can't recall. Right I now. bought a um, uh, Ken Newsom and myself, and uh, we we bought this old amphibious truck, and I started hauling people over to the beach, legislators and politicians and anybody that I thought might have some influence, mm -hmm. would take them over and run them down the beach a little bit, and, and that. None of them had ever been in an amphibious truck. Right. Most of them had never been to the beach. I mean, <laughs> oh, they've been to Atlantic Beach. Mm -hmm. and uh, it just, So you had it over at the Cape? or? Oh, yeah. I'd, mm -hmm. oh, I'd drive the whole length of Core Banks with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, we had, uh, oh, I remember Ruth Barber for going out and you ask her sometime. She, okay. Uh, <laughs> It was fun. Yeah. I mean, to drive into the, off the highway down into the water and then took, just keep took on going. Across. 
because uh, I meant this aluminum skiff, I wore the bottom off of it because I had it tied on behind and I forgot to take it off and I drove the length of Shackleford. <laughs> it polished the barnacles <laughs> off the bottom. Anyway, uh, uh, this this is, I, I'm trying to build up momentum mm -hmm. on that. And, uh, and you were doing this purely from a conservationist, wilderness-loving yeah. person. This was not a job or no, no, oh, no. anything. It was just well, a I, I, I thought what it, it's, it's what should have been done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found a lot of people agreed with me. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people wanted beach cottages over there, and they wanted to keep them. And I, I frankly... what. I, my thought was if it was a fish a co fisherman's cottage, I could understand it, but not for a... Did you meet any of the people that had the camps over on Shackleford? Did, yeah, you, yeah. did you talk with them at length about how they felt about things? No, I don't know whether I really did any. I met them, most of them. Mm -hmm. I talked with them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they, I told them my view, and they had their view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But How about over at, uh, Cape, at the Cape... Uh, Les and Sally. Are they the, are they the per people you talk to the most over there at the Cape? Well, I probably Les and Sally. I talked with most more than any, because they were, they were. I watched. I I remember when they moved from from uh, Atlantic Beach to over there, and uh, they they had a better feel of it than almost anyone. Of course, they of course they were interested in the tourist development, mm -hmm. and then which which I could understand. But, well, anyway, I finally I end up when the, the state decided to make it a, a state park because mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have, there's no thing in the regulations or in the legislation about wilderness in the state. And then almost instantaneously, they said, well, maybe we can get the federal government to take it over. And so I remember going up to the Senate hearings on that, and we were talking about it, and then I was very impressed because the National Wildlife Federation had organized all of the conservation groups, Audubon and, you know, all of them, and it got them together, and they all, and I stood up and talked. I, I was just amazed how many people in the, in the background were endorsing mm -hmm. the idea, mm -hmm. and uh, I was very happy with that. Now, the reason I went, was curious about trying to remember the fellow's name, because me, the first thing that the Park Service came up with within within a week of the approval was to extend the highway on down. And they had a map showing every mile or half mile of uh, marina, hotels, facilities. On Core Banks. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And that just that made me mad. It, sure, as sure. Had, and I really have never had not had not a lot to do with the Park Service since. <laughs> but that didn't happen. So no, no, it, 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 it didn't. But <laughs> but it was. It, it just it it infuriated me. Yeah, I think uh, their their only example at the time was Cape Hatteras, and that's yeah. what happened up there. And as I said, I mean, that was about the time just before that was when we were flying down. And I often wondered if they, that film that I shot for them was so they could use that for developing mm. that, that, that so, so let's back up for the tape about the film. Tell, tell me how that came about and, and what it was and who you did it for. They, so they, we, maybe we can find it the later. The director of the Park Service up mm. in Washington, at the, there, I got acquainted with him, and he asked me if he knew I did photography. And he asked me if I would do this film for him. Now, it's, it was raw footage. I, it wasn't a finished film or anything else. And I, sh I flew, in a, they, they arranged to have a marine helicopter come in, and I flew the length of the mostly core banks. And, and this was a moving picture. This was a yeah. film. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, I, again, I turned it all over to them, and I never, I don't know what happened to it. 16 millimeter? 16 that? millimeter. And yeah. it was about... Running length was probably about 40 minutes, hour? I couldn't tell you. Did you have to change canisters? Oh, yeah, I had to change films a couple of times. A couple of times, okay. 
But I, I, I just, I don't remember. That's a long time ago. About what year were we talking about? When did Park, when would... 1960 was when things started happening. Oh, okay, that must have been 1960 then. Okay. Well, and that's good. And I bet you that film is probably up in the Smithsonian or, or the archive somewhere. And, and, but that's good. We'll, I, I know uh, when oh. we talked years ago, you told me about it. And I was hoping to run across it at the Maritime Museum. But it well, it's, it's, it's strictly raw footage. I, didn't, I never saw it again. I handed it to them. You, did you develop it? I didn't develop it. You didn't they, develop no, it? No, they did. Oh, okay. Did you ever see the raw footage? Nope. No. Well, we need to find that. that <laughs> well, there might have been a lens cap on there. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. I doubt that. But, uh, yeah, that would be so interesting to see that now. No, that was it as the first. Did you go up? Within a month right. or so afterwards. That's pretty quick for federal government, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, again, I can't, I can't. That's Swear a long, to it. Though. That's yeah. a long time ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. So, uh, what else? Well, I was going to say, um, uh, you weren't here for the 33 storm or anything like that. So. No. I was Hazel, Connie, Dion, mm -hmm. uh, those. And uh, and the park pretty much survived pretty well from all those big storms. Wasn't anything there. Right. <laughs> it didn't make any difference. We there were cut few inlets cut. Mm -hmm. They filled they filled in. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of erosion, but. Mm -hmm. And you you've seen that picture fifty years later of the lighthouse where the the moving of the sand, haven't you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was almost what two two thirds of a way from the water's edge, and now it's two thirds of a mile. That first picture I took was about fifty years ago. So this. Do you remember uh, any of that story about how? Um, uh, the Park Service was going was going to handle the uh, erosion problem over there with the lighthouse. The what problem? The erosion problem with the lighthouse. Do you remember how they were going to handle that? Oh, uh, there was nothing they could do about it. Mm -hmm. We could build groins and wash it away some other place. Right. right. Get a dredge out there and pump it in from. Right. Yeah. You, uh, excuse me. I'm my, I'm very skeptical about this. Beating Mother Nature. Ma, Ma Nature is going to put it where she would. Exactly. Or Grandpa Nature. I don't care what. <laughs> what, gender, what gender it is. <laughs> yeah. My, my, my contention is you're going to have points of erosion and relief places. That's, uh, well, think of all the inlets that you've had the length of core banks. Right. Right. Um, tell me. I know it's in, in the book, but just to ha have it in your own words about the Sylvia too. Tell me how you got her. and, and uh, Groundhog Day, there was a storm, on, and uh, about nine, eight, nine, ten o'clock, it blew up really a full hurricane force wind, in my opinion. And uh, Waterfront really wasn't prepared for it. And the uh, Sylvia too. Well, a lot of other boats, but the line, but one of the bow lines broke and uh, it came down on the piling mm. and put a hole in the hull that you could walk through. Mm. Well, she sank, uh, naturally. <laughs> and the next morning I was down there in the waterfront taking pictures and so forth and I asked, uh, Theodore was sitting there looking at the just a stack of smoke stack and a little of the running light. I mean, the masthead light was sticking out. And I said, well, Theodore, what are you going to do now? And he said, I don't know. He says, I'm too old to start over again. And uh, I said, well, that's the prettiest boat I think I'd ever seen. And uh, he said, you want to buy it? <laughs> I said, no. Nah. <laughs> With the mass of really light sticking nah. out of the water. <laughs> he said, no. I said, no. I said, I'll tell you what. He says, give me $300 and you can have it. Oh. 
Well, I went home, I think it's sort of mulling it over in my mind. I, no, I know. But hell, the propeller ought to be bronze propeller close to that. Yeah. And then the L salvageable. <laughs> I went back the next morning. Theodore was still there. I remember coming by. And I said, Theodore, I said, I tell you what, I'll, I'll give you three. Oh, well, how about make it 450? <laughs> Uh, no, I said, the, Theodore, that's the wrong bargaining way. I said, Theodore, you said three. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 350 if the engine works. Okay, sold. Well, I found out later, really, it didn't belong to Theodore. It belonged to Tony Seaman. Yeah, that's that's right. That's right. Because he used, didn't wasn't the Sylvia II one of the boats that he used? Well, there were two boats, two Sylvias. Okay, maybe it was Sylvia. Johnny, Johnny Siren, and Theodore Lewis. And, and Johnny had the, the Sylvia, and Theodore had Sylvia II. And they were almost identical. Mm -hmm. The only difference is inside the cockpit, Johnny's was curved, mine was square, or Sylvia II was square inside the cockpit. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh we drug it, uh, pulled it at uh, high tide. We drug it up as far as we could. As the tide went up, out, we put a patch on the bow, and then as the tide came in, floated a little bit further in, mm -hmm. and I uh, put some pumps on it, and drug it back here to the creek, and hauled it out, and started repairs. And a long, 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 long time <laughs> later, we had her floating. Wow. She's, what, did, uh, what did Mary say when you towed that in, in the yard? She, <laughs> Mary was, it's like when we bought our first boat. I walked down there in the waterfront and I looked at that boat. Cap Bill, Baloo, mm -hmm. had pointed it out and said, now there's a good buy. I said, that, you could live on that boat and be comfortable. And Mary was with me and I said, well, what do you think, Mary? And she looked at it and said, I'm game if you are. She was when such I, a sport, wasn't oh, she? Oh, she was. She's, she's, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway. Uh, so she didn't. Did, did she said, uh, what a lovely boat when you brought it up, didn't she? She was right in there working on it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a picture of her working inside the hole. <laughs> well, you, you can through, I'll take pictures taken through the hole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So she's uh Anyway, that's where I ended up with that boat. And one of my goals, as you well know, is to have it preserved. Because I think it's like the Manhattan fleet is gone, the whaling fleet, every, all that stuff is gone. I don't think the state gives a damn. I don't think the state has any conscience at all. Now, by the way, you remember this. You know when the wooden boat show? Mm -hmm. You know that. You remember how that started? It started on the Moorhead waterfront, and it was Heritage Week. Do mm -hmm. you remember that? I, I, I don't. That was a little bit before my time, but well, that was Heritage Week, and we we trying to to bring it up the whole thing and. Uh, uh, let's see, Sammy Dalton was involved, and that's about the time that... Uh, was Josiah Bailey involved? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. All of those people were yeah. D.G. Bill. Yeah. Um, let's see. And um, who was the uh, first director of the museum fired front port? Uh, McNeil, Charles McNeil. Charles, Charles. Okay. McNeil was involved. I don't know whether he, this was, he, he, at this point, he was in trouble at the point. And I, I never did find out why he was canned. I, I just heard he was, and, and uh, it was really tough for him yeah. uh, after that. And, uh, well. Until the museum. And then over. that's the reason we recommended him. Now, as you know, that, that I started that museum. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, well, I said I, Mary, Mary, and I, and we thought that Charles I knew he needed a job, and because of his, he was the only one around that had a little bit of maritime background. He went to Kingsport. He That's was a Kingsport graduate. Yeah. That that was that was the number one yeah. reason that we nominated and was, him. And I think he, I thought I heard him say one time that he thought he got the job because at the time. 
He didn't have any work, anything else to do. He built a boat in his backyard, a oh, skiff no. in his backyard. No, it was because they they were looking for someone. They were looking for several people, mm-hmm. and uh, we we suggested that he was the only one that had a little bit of qualification. Mm-hmm. Uh, said that people built boats, but that 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 really isn't it. Uh, we didn't have any. Uh, there were well. Sudbury, but those people, they weren't. He is somebody. They were historian. You could put the put the boats in context. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the way that's the way we felt, Mm -hmm. and uh, that's the reason we suggested that he get the job. I don't know whether he ever knew that. Well, I I don't know. I mean, I just just overheard them say one day about he thought because he had written an article about boat boat building in his backyard. He might not have known the. I don't think the machinations going on behind no. the scenes. Well, this is like the reason that it was transferred to Beaufort. Mm-hmm. You know why, don't you? Tell me, I don't. Uh, we had a real politician who was the mayor of Beaufort, John Castle. Oh, Doctor John, uh huh. John was we said was appointed on the board. Chestnut Costello, um, let's see, uh, Doctor. Borden, Borden, uh-huh. uh, Tony, Mary and I, Sammy Doughton, and, uh, and probably it was more, but those are the ones I remember just offhand. And then, well, Costello was working with Duke at the time, so we thought, should and I certainly ought to have all of the facilities. Well, I didn't know that, and, and I found out later, I got a call from Jim Graham one time, Shortly, Commissioner of Agriculture. Right. Huh? And said, so Bob says, I think I could get a little money for that maritime museum, the, for the Hampton Maritime Museum. Uh, said, uh, would you find any problem if it, we moved it to Beaufort? And I said, No, as long as it stay in the county. I mean, I don't see any problem. So well, I think I can get some funding. Was well, a long time later that it was Coslow that had been working <laughs> on Jim Graham. I mean, it's all right. I mean, see, I, I, uh, I always say that it was a, a miracle to me. I went to school at element at Camp Glen Elementary School, and you, you were, and you were recommended by my wife. And I thank you so much. Did you know that? I did not know that. I did not know that. But did I was in school, elementary school, and we brought a bag lunch one day, and walked across the street to where. The remember the uh, the fish um, the um, fish models mm-hmm. and the boat models were in a little building uh, across the street from the Camp Glen Elementary School, mm-hmm. and Sundance had to go. <laughs> had, had to let, let had to let the dog out. Let the dog chase the squirrel. Oh, there you go. And uh, some of those same fish models, Bob. And those boat models were the ones, when I got the job over at the museum, they're the ones I was taking care of. Well, I, I, over there, we, we remember there was three or four, oh, they were maybe eight or ten. Mary was had more to do that. I, I didn't. I mean, I didn't know anybody. <laughs> I mean, uh, but Mary was, knew the... Uh, uh, and she made several recommendations, and most of most of whatever she said was followed. Oh, that's great. But um, well, I wish she was here to thank personally today. But. Look, everything that I claim credit for, she had. She had a hand in, didn't she? Well, you all were inseparable to me in my mind. It's not, there's not one without the other. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. that's how it was. Yeah. Now, did you teach her photography, or was or or uh, was it the other no, way around? She, no, she 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 supported me while I. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, she was your muse, wasn't she? Well, she she would do the editing of the uh, whatever I wrote, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, she could uh, she could type better than I could. And um, she could spell, and I couldn't. <laughs> and uh, she just, just, she was the driving force. There you go. She, she managed it without pushing me. 
Right. Well, maybe she pushed me, but I didn't. You didn't mind. I didn't. I didn't mind. <laughs> I was extremely fortunate. Yes. Very few people were ever. I know. I know. Had that kind of partnership. But I think you're pretty lucky with uh, your second wife here. She seems so nice. She is. She's very nice. Wonderful. And, She's, and, uh, she lost her husband about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, I got a package coming in. Oh, good. You know, do you know Watson? No, I saw him out he, of the yard. He's stone cold deaf. Oh, bless his heart. And, I'm just uh, going to... Let's see, we were talking about Sylvia, too. And uh, so you got her fixed up. So so what did you use, Sylvia? I mean, was it just a pleasure boat for you? Yeah, except we were, for a while we were taking kids out, and that was a lot of fun. Um, we'd uh, particular I don't know why, they seemed to be New York and Pennsylvania's late grades, upper grade school mm -hmm. kids. And we'd take them out in the sound and uh, make them sort of run the boat Except we ran the boat, but uh, they, they'd stand there and put, put their hands on the wheel. They were working there. We'd, we'd just keep them from getting into trouble. Right. Then uh, we'd drop an anchor somewhere. You, Bill was aboard a, on a lot of the mating, yeah. my brother. And anyway, we'd uh, make the kids take a net and set a net or a crab pot or whatever it was, we'd go, poke around for a clam. And uh, stick them and just make them splash around and then put them back aboard and draw, ran a trawl board, a couple of trawl boards. And How did they find you? How did they know that you I could don't know. do that? You don't know? I don't know. Was it, was it school through centered? A, I think it's through, through that. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, now that. Is there in the business card up there? Is that, That's a silver spray probably for the waterway. Can you read that card there? Not, not from there. <laughs> not from here. Let's see. Which one is? It says waterway guide. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that was when I was doing the waterway work. Uh, somewhere around, I have some, some cards that we printed up. Well, I, I, and so that was really the precursor to any of the field trips, school field trips that now the the aquarium and the Maritime yeah, Museum I, I, and uh, yeah. Corsau Museum do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that was the idea. That's what I wanted the boat for. Not, I, I, I'm not. I, I have a tonnage had. I, I let it expire, but um, I'm not in the boat business, and and. It just seemed as if it a thing it to do. You. It found you, kind of. Yeah, and that's the same. What I wanted to do now, what I want that boat for, I don't want it. I, I get rid of it, clean it, but I want someone to take it and use it mm -hmm. and maintain it as a historic item. Number one, as a historic, and two, as an educational tool. Well, I'm just going to, uh, I, I got something I want to talk to you about, but it doesn't need to be on, on this tape, but uh, I want to thank you for having me here today. And, Pleasure. Uh, um, you're just a, a talented, marvelous well, thank you fellow. For, thank you for the snow job. Who, <laughs> who has made a difference in Carter County, well, so thank you yeah, so much. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you later.